All right, the title of my sermon this morning is Building a Godly Desire. Building a Godly Desire. You know, I've often heard believers say things like, I know I should do right, but I just don't have the desire to do it. You know what I mean? Like people think that that's something that's, you know, obviously stopping them from serving God. He's building up this desire to even do it in the first place. Now, when people say things like, I should do right, but I don't have the de desire to do it, I mean, this should be expected, right? I mean, this should be expected when you get saved, when you haven't been living for God for a long while, that obviously your flesh, the desires of your flesh are going to be so much stronger than the desires of your spirit. So you don't want to be discouraged just because you're thinking, ah, oh, you know, I'm saved, but why do I just not care about the things of God? Why do I not care about doing things for God? Now, is that a good place to be in? No, we want to get out of that. We want to grow in our desire for serving God, grow in our desire to want to serve the body of Christ, get involved in the work, but you don't want to be discouraged if you're, if you're at that place. That's expected, right? We have the flesh, it's there. And that's the problem with works-based assurance of salvation. You know, obviously we believe salvation is by grace through faith, and we say, hey, it's not of works, but also your assurance that you get knowing that you're saved should not be based on works either. It shouldn't be based on your desire because that's going to mislead a lot of people. They'll be thinking, well, if I'm saved, you know, why do I have this? Why do I still have these sinful desires? If I'm saved, why don't I have a stronger desire to serve God? You need to understand what's happening within you, why there isn't a desire there, and it's because the desire of the flesh is just stronger. And now this is what Paul goes through. This is why we read Romans 7. And I'm not going to go into it in, in, in a lot of detail, but as we read through Romans 7, you read and heard there that internal struggle that Paul has between the flesh and the spirit, where the flesh wants to sin, right? And he's like asking, like, how do I, you know, I, like my mind wants to do the right thing, but how do I do it? And he's saying, thank God that through Jesus Christ, I'm delivered from only having to sin, and now I'm able to serve. I, I have this this uh, spirit that I'm able to follow and overcome these sins. So, like I said, the desire to not want to do right will be there because the flesh is there. So that should be expected, but that doesn't mean that's where we should be. And you know what? Getting to the place, getting to the stage in your spiritual life where you actually want to do things for God for the right reasons, right? Because you can do things for God for the wrong reasons. What are some wrong reasons? Social pressure, you know, because I'm bugging you to go, because you're worried about what other people will think of you if you're not there, you know, you know like, I don't want to face the other people because, I, you know, I missed the soul winning or I didn't come to church. Or, you know, some other reasons might be like you're just excited, you know, like new people, they get, they get saved. It's all new to them. It's exciting. It's like, oh, I'm curious. You know, it's exciting to go out. Soul or I'm curious. It's like, oh, I've never been soul winning before. You know, I've never been to a church before. They start going to cure it. They're learning new things. So curiosity, excitement, peer pressure, like social pressure, they may get, that may get you moving. I'm not saying these things are inherently bad, right? Because we need a little bit of a push in the right direction, right? Preaching as well. You may just go because you heard me preach on it. You get a bit convicted. You feel a bit guilty. You do things. So these things can get us moving. They're not necessarily bad in and of themselves. But you know what? This doesn't last. This is not going to give you a lasting desire to actually want to serve, right? What's going to give you that lasting desire is out of love for God. And that's actually a, a further stage in your spiritual life. So for people to think, you know, I just get saved, I'm just going to have like, oh, this, this desire to just do right all the time. I mean, they're kidding themselves. So first of all, we need to have realistic expectations that serving God is some hard work and actually getting to that point where you love to do the right thing for the right reasons is actually the, the epitome, right? It's the height of, of spiritual maturity. Look in 2 Peter 1. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So we see like this building as you grow in your faith. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, temperance. So I see you believe, you start doing things that are right, you're learning things. Temperance is where you're like disciplined. Patience is when you go through hard times, right? 
and to patience, godliness. This is when you're living right. And the last thing, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. So to love your brother, and look at the last one, and to brotherly kindness, charity. You see how charity is like, at the, it's like when you reach, it's like when you reach the end, you're like a charitable person, you know, because that's, that's ultimately what defines a Christian, right? Is you are somebody that is filled with charity. <clears throat> so don't think that that's like the first step. So don't think like, you know, don't get discouraged that you're not all the way at the end. I mean, that's what we're all striving for. So if we have at least that expectation, you won't get discouraged. But then you know, hey, this is, this is normal. It's normal for people to not have this strong desire. But today's sermon is about how do we, how do we get there? How do we get there, right? How do, we, how do we grow in the right desire so we overcome the, the bad desire that is stopping us from serving God? <clears throat> Look in 2 Thessalonians 3. It says here, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. See, so if everyone just loved doing the right thing all the time, I mean, why would Paul be saying it's, it's weary? It wearies you to keep doing the right thing, right? Because it's hard work. It's not, you don't always feel like doing it. You know, you have to force yourself to do it. So walking in the Spirit, yes, you can get joy from that, but it's not always joyful, right? It's, it's, sometimes it's hard work because of why? Because the flesh makes you want to quit. The flesh makes you want to give up. But that's why you want to get to the point knowing that it's not always going to be pleasant to do what's right. It's not always going to be exciting. It's not always going to be fun. It's not always going to be the thing you want to do. You've got to do it anyway. right? So that's why you've got to get to the point in your spiritual life where you realize, I don't just do things because I feel like it. You do things because it's right, even though you don't feel like it. You know, you may not have felt like coming to church this morning. Does that mean it was the wrong thing to do? No, it was the right thing to be here, even if you didn't feel like coming, right? Even if you don't feel like getting involved in the ministries and the soul winning, it's right to do. And you've got to get to that point in your life where even if you don't feel like it, you do it anyway. Now, as we read in Romans, we learn more in Galatians 5. Why is it? Why is it that it's this, there's this struggle that goes on? Why? Because we have the flesh and the spirit. Galatians 5. This I say then... Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. So I just want to focus here on this here, because this is sort of the crux of my sermon today. Is, so people ask, well, so how do I get this desire to want to do what's right? How do I get this desire? And what you've got to understand is that it's not that you don't have the desire. Right? The desire is there. Why? Because if you're saved, obviously I'm, I'm assuming for a saved person that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not just the flesh. When you get saved, you have the flesh and the spirit. Right? So it's not that the desire is missing right? and it needs to be obtained. When you get saved, the desire is now there. The question is, why is the desire so weak? Right? Because now you've got two. You've got the flesh and you've got the spirit. And I've always been taught it this way. It's, you've got to think of it like you have two animals, right? You've got the flesh and the spirit. Now, if you have, like, say, two dogs and you only ever feed one and you starve the other and these dogs have to fight, who's going to win? The stronger dog's going to win, right? Why? Because you're constantly feeding it. You're constantly Walking in the flesh, feeding the flesh, strengthening that desire. So, and then you think, well, where is the godly desire? Well, the godly desire has been so weak and so starved and so quenched that when they go to fight, they always lose. So you've got to think, how do I grow this desire? Well, what are you feeding? Are you feeding the flesh? Because you know what? If you start feeding the spirit, it's going to be hard in the beginning, right? Because that other fleshly dog is going to be there. It's going to be hard for that dog. As he's starting to grow in, in, in strength and in stamina, it's going to be a battle. But you know, one day that desire is stronger and it becomes a lot easier to defeat that flesh. Now, does that fleshly dog ever disappear? No, it's always there. It's always fighting. So the idea is not one way you can think of it. And obviously there's two ways you can do it, right? When you have these two, if you think of it, these two animals. One way is you can starve the dog, 
starve the fleshly dog. But sometimes that's a lot harder. Right? It's a lot harder to just go, you know what, don't sin. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's very hard to do. But that's one way, is you starve that dog. But the other way you can think of it is, well, let me just like force feed this other dog, right? I'm just going to make sure I'm doing stuff in the spirit. And that's what I wanted you to think of this morning. When you think of growing this desire, well, what are you feeding? You've got to feed that spiritual dog more food, the spirit more, so that your desire, your spiritual desire strengthens. And this is why I think it's phrased this way as well. Look, this I say then, walk in the spirit. So you see how he's, he's commanding you, hey, you've got to do the right thing, even though you don't feel like it, because it's going to be this battle. And look, and the result is, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So it's not just a case of abstaining from lust, which is right as well, because Romans says, mortify the deeds of the flesh. But you've got to also add spiritual things in order to feed the spirit so that you will not, you know, you will give no place for the lusts of the flesh. So that's what I want to talk about this morning, is one of the keys to building a godly desire, and just some of the things I'm going to share with you this morning, obviously my experience and how I go about things, is you have to think of it that way. It's not just about going, I'm not going to do this, and then not replacing it with something else, right? So say you're, you're idle, right? And you're getting into, like, say, watching pornography, right? Some people boys do that. You're idle, and then you're just in front of your computer, and then you're just watching pornography because you're there. You need to replace it with other things. You need to get busy so you don't give place for the flesh. You know, walk in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So it's not just about having the willpower to not sin. It's about feeding the Spirit so that when they battle again, you are able to, to more likely say no to that sinful desire. So I want to talk about six ways, <clears throat> six ways that we can feed this Spirit and that we can walk in the Spirit, hopefully grow in our desire to want to do things. So we don't want to get sucked into and deceived into thinking we only have to do things because we feel like it. What we have to do is do it even though we don't feel like it and then the desire starts to build. That's how it works. You start doing it, you start feeding the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. As the Spirit gets stronger, that desire starts to build. Why? Because now it's stronger, it starts to overpower the flesh and that battle that's going on inside of you. So six things I want to share with you this morning. One is, first one is <clears throat> to meditate on the love of God. Meditate on the love of God. And just some practical, what, what, when, I talk, when, I, when I say that, what I mean by this is you know, meditate on salvation. Meditate on what Jesus Christ did for you. A couple of thoughts there is Psalm 143. Look what it says here. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hand. So muse just means to think, right? You consider. You, when you meditate. Now we're not talking about the new age meditation where you just clear your mind of everything. You know, oh, that, That's how the new age meditation. That's like getting your mind out and just thinking of nothing. That's very dangerous. Right? Dangerous to have just nothing in you. Why? Because you sweep, clean that house, like the Bible says, and then you've got spirits that can come into you because there's nothing there to stop them from being in there. So when we say meditate on things, what we're, not, we're not saying clear your mind. We're saying you actually think on, you purposely think on the things of God. You know, you purposely are thinking about the Word. That's why the Word of God is described as food because, and the strong meat because you're chewing on it chewing on it, you're thinking on it, and sometimes you'll do that. That's a good thing if you're memorizing scripture, you're thinking about scripture throughout the day, you, and you start getting into doctrinal things, it's good to engage with things where you're, you're having to fight and argue and debate and things, because why? Because then during the day you start thinking, like, oh my God, I wonder how that works. You're thinking about verses, you're meditating on the Word of God. This gets you thinking spiritually, walking in the Spirit. Right, particularly trying to grow that desire, you know, you've got to think about what Jesus went through for you. And there are verses, obviously, God loving us. 1 John 4, <clears throat> in this was manifested the love of God towards us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
You know, sometimes when you doubt the love of God, it's crazy for us to doubt the love of God when Jesus Christ was manifested and died for us. The proof of God's love to you was that the Son of God was manifested, was crucified, died, was buried, and rose again for you. Isn't that amazing, though, that even though that happened, we doubt the love of God. We go, oh, God doesn't love me. God's done with me. And yet the very proof that God loves you is that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Look, in this was manifested the love of God towards us. How do we know that God loves us? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Romans 5, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. What is that saying? It's very rare that somebody would ever risk their life for, a good, for somebody who's done right. right. That's very rare. It says, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. So if somebody's righteous, it's like it's already rare. And it's like even less rare that if somebody's good, some would die for them. But look, this is the context of Romans 5.8. You've probably quoted it so many times out soul winning. You know what Romans 5.8 is teaching? He's saying, you wouldn't even die for a righteous man. That's how, ra that's how rare it is. But you know what? God commended. He praises. He lifts up his love. His love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, enemies of God, we didn't want anything to do with God, yet God came. Christ died for us. That's amazing. We didn't deserve God's love. We didn't even love God, yet he gave his love to us. And that's why sometimes when I reflect on eternal security and you just think, like these are the sort of things I think of, like I'm telling you how you can build a love for God. You know when Jesus went to the cross, like he knew everything that you were going to do. Have you ever done something good for somebody and then they like wrong you and you just like, you kind of like regret doing that thing for them? <laughs> you know, like maybe you've done something good and then they, they wrong you or they bad mouth you. You know what? I, just, I, should have, I didn't know you were going to do that to me. But you know what? Sometimes you do something to God and, and but it, how am I trying to describe this? You know, it's like God, see you don't know the bad things you're going to do in the future. You don't know the sins you're going to commit against God. But God, when he went to the cross, like he, he knew all that. So there's never going to be a point where God says, oh, I can't believe you did that for me. You did that against me. He knew it all. He knew all the things that you are not even, you know, even done yet. All the, all, something in the future that may disgust you and think like, oh, just, I can't believe it. I do this against God. He, know, he knew all that. So when Jesus died on the cross, I don't even, even realize that. That's why sometimes when we doubt the love of God, eternal security really like brings it home to realize, man, God really loves me unconditionally. Because when he went to the cross, he knew all the things that I was still going to do to him. And yet he died for me anyway. That's an amazing thing. So not only that, but obviously preaching the gospel. Like when you go out and you preach the gospel to other people, it reminds you of the love of God. And when you're reminded of these things, it grows a desire to want to be grateful and serve God. That's one way that you can grow in your desire, is you meditate on the love of God. You meditate on how God has saved you. And you meditate on how sinful you are and how much you don't deserve God's love and yet he died for you anyway. That should drive you to serve God more. Second one is giving thanks. <laughs> giving thanks, being grateful for the things that God gives to you. So when you consider those things, that grows your desire to want to serve God. Ephesians 5, giving thanks for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've often heard it explained this way. Ephesians 5 is saying all the things that you receive as blessings you're grateful for. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, because it's giving thanks always for all things, and 1 Thessalonians 5 says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So this is more so no matter what situation you're in, because you may be in good situations, in bad situations, you ought to be grateful for what you have. 
Hebrews 13, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So when we think about giving thanks to God and what God has blessed us with, there's so many things we take for granted. Yeah, we may not have the rich life or the prosperous life compared to other more rich people, but then we forget that compared to a lot of poor people in the world, we are so prosperous. You know, we don't think about what clothes we're going to wear. We've got nice shoes. We've got food in the fridge. You think about the things that God has blessed you with. It grows your desire to want to do things for Him. Even the things we take for granted, the fact that we can walk, we can see, we can speak, we can touch, we can, we can communicate with each other. Man, these are the things that come from God. And if we give thanks for them, we're grateful for those, that's going to build a desire in us to want to serve Him more. <clears throat> All right, let's get into some others. So the first couple is obviously the right frame of mind. We want to grow in our love for God and that love is what lasts and drives us to want to serve God. Number three <clears throat> is keeping your heart and your mind. What are you filling your heart and your mind with? Maybe the reason why you have such a low desire to want to serve God and love God is because you're constantly feeding the flesh by filling your heart and mind with worldly things. Look at what he says here in Luke 6. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. So what do I mean by filling your heart and mind with worldly things? Well, it's what you read. It's what you listen to, the people you decide to follow, the music that you listen to. What are you listening to and reading day in and day out? If what you're reading and listening to is worldly stuff, then obviously your heart's going to be filled with worldly sinful stuff. But if you fill your heart with the Bible, you fill your heart with godly sermons teaching you, reminding you the truths of God's Word, rather than getting in your car and turning on the radio or turning on your old hip-hop songs that are usually about fornication and whatnot, why don't you switch those up for hymns? So that the songs you're listening to, rather than worldly music, you're listening to things that remind you of God's love, remind you of God's truth. So you get into your car, every day you're listening to this worldly hip-hop, and then you wonder why you have no, no love for God. You have no desire to serve God. You, you think about how you spend your time. You turn on the TV. You watch a bunch of Game of Thrones. You, know, you go to the movies. And you watch a bunch of worldly movies with fornication, blaspheming God. And then you wonder, why, why do I have so little desire? I want to do what's right for God. I mean, it's, there's no wonder why. It's because you're feeding the flesh all the time. What are you filling your heart and mind with? So... What am I talking about when I talk about worldly things? Well, the Bible defines what is worldly. It's not just something like, you know, people say like, oh, you, you don't like worldliness, but you use computers, you, know, you use technology. It's not just things that are inside the world. When we talk about worldliness, this is what the Bible describes as worldliness. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man <clears throat> love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lusts of the flesh. So this is what it's defined when it says love, not the world. This is what you ought not to love. The lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So worldliness are the sins that are defined by lust. You know, when you think about looking with lust, desiring, covetousness, and also pride. You know, pride is like looking great in front of everyone and lifting yourself up. That's what worldliness is. And, you know, it's so, it's, 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 it's sometimes you just, you, these, these verses that just sort of confirm in your own heart, like God knows what he's talking about. Because when you read a passage like this, this is what defines Hollywood. This is what defines the world when they try and appeal to people. It's always through lust, how you, it's going to make you feel, how it's going to make you look. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So that's what is worldliness. Worldliness. If you're filling your heart and mind with these things, then that's what's going to defile you. Matthew 15. 
Look at what Jesus says. Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? So what is Jesus saying here? Because obviously, if you don't know this story, people were eating with unwashed hands and then Jesus is saying, hey, it's the things you eat don't defile you because whatever you eat, you know, it, it goes out. You know, if you eat with unwashed hands, it's going to go out in the draught, right? You're going to go to the toilet. It's going to come out. <clears throat> but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the man, from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. See, so what are you filling your heart and your mind with? If you fill your heart and mind with worldliness, when it comes out of your heart, it's going to defile you. Right? It's going to build that worldly, that ungodly desire rather than the godly desire. All right, number four. <clears throat> number four is changing your circle of influence. Changing your circle of influence. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 6, because this is another reason why people don't have a, good, a strong desire to want to do right. They don't have a strong godly desire because it's the people they're hanging around. The people they're hanging around have... have you know, are very worldly, or they have no desire to serve God. You know, they may be saved even. They may be saved, but they don't have a strong desire to serve God. And you can continue to hang around with those people day in, day out, week after week, rather than trying to change your circle of influence to hang around with more godly people that are encouraging you to do right, trying to get you involved in the ministry. You wonder why. Why do I have such a low desire to do what's right? It's because of your circle of influence. Be ye not unequally yoked together, with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now this verse is not teaching that you can't be friendly with unbelievers. So I'm not saying that, you know, it's like you can't associate with unbelievers at all. You can't associate with your saved friends that are not living for God at all. A yoke is when you have like, re you think about what a yoke is. <laughs> a yoke is, is that thing that goes over the two oxen's neck that binds them together, that forces them together and they work together plowing this land. So what this is talking about is these really close-knit relationships. And that's what really affects you in the end. I mean, if you're just an acquaintance with somebody or you see someone every now and then, they don't have that much effect on you in terms of your spiritual life and your spiritual growth. But you know the ones that do have an effect on you? The ones that you're yoked up with. The ones that they, they're like, you know, we, oh man, we're like this, right? And if you're like this, whatever, we're like this, we're BFFs, and your BFF, you know, best friends forever, is some worldly, ungodly, not in church, that's going to affect you. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived into thinking it doesn't affect you. It affects you. So I'm not saying that you can't associate with them at all. What I'm saying is, if you have people like that that are dragging you down, if you change your circle of influence and you start hanging around with more godly people, people that are encouraging you to do right, you know what? That's going to help you increase your godly desire, right? Because you're feeding the Spirit, you're walking more in the Spirit rather than spending time with people walking in the flesh. 1 Corinthians 15. <laughs> Be not deceived. Don't deceive yourself into thinking it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. It does. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Right? You hang around with the wrong people, that's going to drag you down. So your circle of influence is very important. Now number five is, <clears throat> where we talked about starving the flesh, that is one of them. There are sins that you need to cut out of your life. You know, if it's drugs, if it's, you know, if it's not fornication, you know, if it's, you know, you know, wasting time, laziness, all, all sorts of sins, right? <laughs> but not only sins you want to cut out that are holding you back, but sometimes our life is just too full of vain things. 
things that are not sinful in and of themselves, but they're just vain. There's too much of it, right? Holidays, pleasure, fun, that, that sort of stuff. Is there a place for these things? Yeah, there's a place for R&R, &R, you know, rest and relaxation. You refresh. But if your life is just that, that's going to hold you back. That's going to get you walking too much because now your life is too focused on the flesh. Hebrews 12. <clears throat> Look at this. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. So you see how it's not just sin that besets you. Sometimes you just have vain things in your life, weights in your life holding you back. And it says, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So the spiritual life is likened to a race. Now what do are, what are athletes do when they're racing? Man, they're pretty much naked, some of them. You know, take all, you know, they're wearing the skins these days, really light shoes. Are you going to go running? Now, is it wrong? for a runner to hold like a 100 kilo dumbbell while he's running? No, I mean, if he wants to, he can. But is he gonna run effectively? Is he gonna run quick? So that's why you think about how much vain weight you have in your life. It's gonna hold you back. It's gonna make it that much harder to run in the spirit, right? And run the race that's set before you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So that's going back to, remember, considering what Jesus did for us, considering what Jesus done. So even here it's saying, hey, as you run the race with patience, think about the Lord Jesus Christ, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. So again, remember, be not weary in well-doing. Because it's not easy, guys. It's not always going to be fun. But we have to do it anyway. Galatians 6. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. <coughs> As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You only have so much time you only have so much life. Don't just fill your life with pleasure and vain things and the thorns of this life. Try and fill your life with things that matter. Ministry, service, serving one another, you know, edifying your family, building up your family to serve God. Don't just fill it with pleasure and movies and sport and holidays and recreation and all that sort of stuff. And as you fill your life with ministry and things that matter, you know what? You may not believe it now, but you'll actually start to enjoy it. You know, because you're, now you're walking in the Spirit. You remember how we talked about walking in the Spirit and the flesh? If you just start filling your time and your life, filling your mind with the things of God, filling your life with the things of God, with purpose, you know what? You'll start to enjoy those things. And, and, and then one thing is you'll start to realize you're doing things that actually matter. You know, you do things that matter, there's joy from that because you know, I just did this, I just invested my time and it wasn't wasted time. I have rewards in heaven waiting for me. And the last one, the last one I want to talk about is to help you grow in your godly desire is the reminder for you to consider your impact on other people. See, that's one thing that drives me, but that's one thing that should drive everybody. It's what should drive us to have a godly desire. Is how is my life and my example and my actions going to affect the people that I have influence over? The people that I don't have influence over, but are looking to me as an example. So not only to believers, but for unbelievers as well. That makes me want to grow my desire to serve God because I want to be an effective witness in this world. Second, First Peter 2, look at this. For so is the will of God. This is what God wants. That with well-doing, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. See, God wants us to have a good testimony. He doesn't just want us to be saved. He wants us to be doing good and have a good testimony in the world because it's going to affect it, help us 
be a more effective witness. It's going to make unbelievers think differently about God. That's why we are ambassadors. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. So you've got to remember, Jesus Christ is not here representing himself. You are his representative. So when you go about your life, you go about your work, how you behave in your family, the stands that you take, you are that ambassador. They are looking to you. You are the representative of Jesus Christ in that circle of influence. What is the impact of your example? You know, what impact are you having? That ought to drive you. That, that will build your desire to want to be godly when you start to consider the impact your actions have on the people around you. So not only unbelievers, but also the believers. 1 Timothy 4. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So remember, this is like now the teaching, right? So this is specifically to a leader in the church, that we can apply these same principles in our life. You know, even as a father or as a parent, that we are constantly reminding our children of the right things, but refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself <coughs> rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Acceptation, For therefore we both labour and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the saviour of all men. So you see there the work and the suffering that they go through for doing right, especially of those that believe. <clears throat> These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So you see that all aspects of your life should be an example for somebody else to follow. What is your example? When you think about your example, are you happy with the example that you would set? Would you want, when you, when you think about Christianity in Sydney, in Christianity in Australia, would you want every Christian to be like you? See, that's how you reflect. That's how I reflect. It's like, do I, would I want everyone to be like me? If not, man, I've got to improve my example because I need to be an example to people. I, I need to live the way I want others to live. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Look at this. <laughs> Meditate upon these things. So it's not just for new believers. This is for leaders as well. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Look at this. That thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself, and look at this, and them that hear thee. So you see how our example has a real effect on other people. And you need to consider your impact on other people so that you, and that will help you grow in your desire to do what's right. So just recapping, number one is we meditate on the love of God. <coughs> what Jesus Christ has done for us. Number two, give, be, be grateful for the things that God has given to you. Number three, we're talking about how we grow in our godly desire. What are you filling your heart and your mind with? If you're filling your heart and mind with worldliness and vain things, then obviously that's going to be feeding the flesh and not feeding the spirit. Number four, changing your circle of influence. Who are you hanging around? Who are your closest friends and people that you are yoked up with, even in business, colleagues? Who are you spending all your time with? This has got to change if, it's, if you're spending your time with ungodly influences. Cutting out sin, but not only sin, but also the vain things for our, from our lives. And also we've got to consider our impact, our example on other people. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I just thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder. I know I'm always, you know, preaching here, Lord, but I need these lessons just as much as everyone here, these reminders. So I just pray, Lord, that you would help us, help us to starve the flesh, Help us to feed the Spirit. 
So when they go to war, Lord, when they war against each other, that the Spirit comes out the winner. Lord, help us. It's not easy. Help us as we uh, try and do right because we can be weary and well-doing. And I just pray, Lord, that all of us here, we take it to heart, our example to the next generation, our example to the people around us, that, Lord, we would strive to do what's right, whether we feel like it or not. And why should we, Lord? Because we love you. So help us, Lord, to grow in our love, grow in our desire. Help us to cut out the vain things of our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.